Good afternoon. I wish to thank the organizers for asking me to present in this session. My talk is entitled Identification of Unknowns by GCMS and LCMS Using the NIST Search with Both Commercial and User Libraries. We use the NIST Search at all of our operations worldwide and Eastman Chemical Company, the main site is in Kingsport, Tennessee, whose picture is shown above, but we have 50 manufacturing sites worldwide with a total of 13,500 employees. A critical part of our operation is the utilization of mass spectrometers. We have over 50 GCMSs and LCMS network worldwide, and all of them use the NIST search software for data processing and library searching. Also, we use the NIST search software to incorporate all of the entries that we identify in our operations into a library that we share. The majority of the samples analyzed in remote laboratories by chemists and chromatography, environmental and synthetic laboratories using Agilent GCMSDs. The user experience varies, but typically they're not highly skilled in mass spectrometry interpretation. If results are not found by the NIST search, files are sent to experts in our central mass spec lab for identification. Export, experts report these results promptly via email and add them to our corporate library when identified. The Eastman Corporate Library is automatically built each night and distributed daily to users. If necessary, samples will be sent to the central mass spec lab for accurate mass chemicalization, advanced sample preparation, and microsynthesis, et cetera. A key part of this process is training people that join our company or even join the mass spectrometry group from another group. We've decided to create two separate courses, courses one on GCMS and one on LCMS, and these can found, be found on my website. They include uh, YouTube videos and also PDF handouts that show screenshots of the settings. It's very important to get the settings properly set up and then save that configuration. And at that point, not much else needs to be changed after they initially set it up and know how to do the basic searches. Also, each handout has a very detailed table of contents such that the user can find topics quickly that they need to read about. Well, what libraries can be searched? Well, there's a variety of them that we could utilize. Uh, the NIST 20 library, which has about 350,000. You'll see other ones. The Wiley is another big library, but we also could uh, search the Wiley specialty libraries, about 11 separate ones of them, depending on your needs. The Mona database, this is a free library that's crowdsourced, costs nothing, you can download. And then there's our East Cor Eastman Corporate Library of about 60,000 entries of proprietary entries that we've added. And even though that's fairly small, it's a very critical part of our, our operation because it contains things that are not in these other libraries. For a total of about 1.3 million that you can search. We also have MSMS libraries. The NIST Tandem Library has about 1.3 million compounds or spectra in it. Uh, the Wiley Tandem Libraries and the Mona has a fairly large database of a free crowdsource database. And then we have a smaller number in our Eastman Corporate Library of MSMS spectra for a total of about 1.4 million spectra that can be searched with the software. So what types of compounds do we add to the Eastman Library? Anything a user would find useful, thus much more diverse than purchased commercial EI and MSMS libraries. Thus users must realize that East, the Eastman Library is an aid to identification and should be used accordingly. Most entries are high quality with high confidence and exact structure. However, some entries will have a question mark or double question mark in front of the name to show some uncertainty. Some entries when added without a structure or a name will be added a reference to manufacturing processes, R&D project names, and detailed sample history. 
what's the importance of the library search and comments in the user library? One particularly important area is in environmental monitoring of our site. Here's a Google area view of the Kingsport site. It's about 4,000 acres with 7,000 employees and 550 buildings with the river that runs down the center uh, that could lead to contamination from processes within the plant. And also our water treatment plant uh, could also spill some overflow into the river of organic comp compounds. So GCMSs are used in conjunction with many total organic carbon water monitors within the plant. And when the, those go out of spec, they grab a sample and analyze it by GCMS. Comments in our library, even if, even if they're not identified exactly, quickly target the source of the spills in our manufacturer or our water treatment plant upsets such that they can be isolated from the river. Exact structure is therefore useful, but not necessary. If there's information about where it's being produced or which process, then it can target the location that needs to be monitored and corrected. So what are the, some of the new things for the NIST in the last six years? They've added things continually every year, and I can't really list all of them, but I'll just list some of the ones that I think are most important. The hybrid search for EI and MSMS, and we'll talk about that in detail. They purchase a lot of high priority compounds and run them in their laboratories. The compounds are analyzed by EI, both underivitized and as their methyl, TFA, TMS, and TBDMS derivatives. They infuse them for MSMS at multiple energies. And that's important. The EI spectra are very reproducible due to the selection of one ionization energy. But MSMS have a lot of variety in how they're acquired energetically, depending on the instrument. So it's very useful to acquire many different spectra at different energies, such that when you do the library search, you'll, have, you'll be more likely to identify a spectrum that was acquired in a similar manner to, manner to which yours was acquired. The quality of the spectra are very important. They're checked by two or more evaluators. So they're all very, very high quality library spectra. Mass spec interpreter has been modified to use accurate mass for better correlation of observed ions to substructures within especially important in MSMS or tandem type data, but is also applied in EI also. They have an ambitious pipeline for targeting and acquiring these new spectra each year. They look over 30 collections, searching for compounds of interest that are, show up in these collections, and then they acquire them, any available chemicals that meet these targets that they found, and then they combine and rank them and acquire both the EI and the tandem library, depending on which is appropriate. And so on average, there's about 10,000 compounds per year, but these create many, many more spectra. So let's talk about the hybrid search. The hybrid search is, a, is what it says, it's a hybrid, it's a mix of two different type searches. Normally when one searches a library, you take your unknown spectrum and you compare it to the standard spectrum of, of, of a compound in the library and get a fit and a rank and then you look at the results. Well, when you do the hybrid, it also creates your spectrum in a neutral loss mode. So the molecular ions at zero, and then the loss of methoxy here would be a minus 31. And it has these neutral loss spectra for all of the compounds in the libraries that you select too. So it compares this neutral loss to that library spectrum and gives you a fit also. So what does it do with this? This is somewhat simplified, but the standard search is used to generate the standard batch factor and hit list, nothing new there. Then it searches the neutral loss spectrum of the unknown, as we said, against the library's neutral loss spectra. It calculates a hybrid score. Now it takes the original score from the standard search here and calculates the neutral loss search and then creates a hybrid score that's weighted properly to get a final factor or search or hit that tells you something about this hybrid search result. And also each compound in the list and your hit list has a delta mass associated with it. And that is 
one, the delta mass, which is the difference in the molecular weight of the unknown and the library hit. So let's take an example to illustrate this. But first, let's talk about the program advantages. The program advantages is it greatly extends the scope of all current libraries. The success requires the presence of similar compounds in the library. Hits are sorted by either standard search match factor and then also the hybrid match factor. So you can look at it either way. You can resort the results automatically just by clicking on the top of the column. And the delta mass reflects the modification of the model molecule. My personal experience with the hybrid search, I've personally used it for over 30,000 EI searches and 500 MSMS searches. I'm routinely amazed by the results I get from it. Useful results are obtained which are not noted in a standard search, thus that's why it extends the scope of the, of the libraries that one uses. Its utility is in identifying unknowns, finding similar model compounds, and supporting fragmentation mechanisms. So let's do an example to illustrate this. Here is an unknown spectra of a compound. We're going to do a standard library search and, and look at the results. In this case, I'm going to talk about the top 50 hits. The top 50 hits show this substructure with the bromine on a fluorine and an aromatic ring with a CH2 group. And the match factor of the, the top entry in the list is only 559 out of, to, and it goes down to 413 for, from going from the highest to the lowest hit in that list. And that's out of a, a perfect fit would be a thousand. So you can see normally when I do searches, if I don't see anything above 850 or so, I don't get very interested, but there is information here. It till, still tells you something about the substructure of the compound. So now we're going to do the hybrid search. Uh, and look at the hybrid results. We'll further look at the neutral loss spectra. And when you do that and merge the scores of the standard plus this neutral loss fit, you'll find this compound, it had a fit of 908 out of a thousand. And so it's a very high fit and it's, it's very worth considering. And if you looked and found where it would be in the standard search, it would be at a fit of 232 out of a thousand if it was actually shown up in the, uh, the standard search list. So you would never go that far down to look for it. So what does it tell you? Well, simply it's related to this compound and this other part told you the substructure had this fluorine in addition to the bromine. So really it indicates that you take the structure at the top and add a fluorine somewhere. So this would be a very likely structure for your unknown. And the delta mass would be calculated of course by the molecular weight of the, your unknown uh, minus that of the best one in the list that it found with 295. So 19 minus one for an exchange of a fluorine a hydrogen for a fluorine is 18. So that's the delta mass of 18. So this is a very simple delta mass and from the substructure, it would be easy to determine. They do have a very novel display of the hybrid search results, which I think is very effective and very efficient at looking at the hits in the list. They, they show here is the hybrid spectrum best fit on the bottom. We have our unknown on the top. Anything that's shifted by the delta mass goes from gray to magenta. And anything fragmented that was not shifted stays blue. So when you look at these after a while, you get used to ignoring the gray and just looking at the blue and the magenta. And you can see why the hit is so high that it approaches just a little over 900, because it actually is a good fit if you look at it in this regard. So what about delta masses? Well, some simple small molecular weight compounds are illustrated below. They could be part of a larger molecule. These substructures can be a part of a lot, much larger molecule, as I said. The odd value in a delta mass indicates that the nitrogens present in the molecule change by one. And of course, in many cases, you'll need isotope ratios or accurate mass to help with the redundancies. So you can see here, this is, would be a little harder to know that a delta mass 50 indicated the replacement of a, a fluorine by a CF3 group. 
or if you had a benzene that now is a naphthalene system, the delta mass would be 50. And as I talked before, these two show where the delta mass is odd. So that indicates that from going from one structure to other, another, the number of nitrogens has changed by one. So some delta masses are easy, some are not so easy. But while I was doing these 30,000 searches, I found over 550 hybrid delta mass values that I found very useful. And I update them regularly on my website and they're in a Excel spreadsheet form. So you can see here, if you just show a, a very small part of it, here's three things that have 50 which you'd have to separate somehow by maybe by the chlorine ratios or accurate mass data. Uh, but again, I hope this will be useful to you to have this delta mass table for some of the more unusual ones. So in summary, I would like to say that the NIST search is a very powerful tool for identifying unknowns by GCMS and LCMS. It's essential to our Eastman R&D manufacturing and environmental functions. It's utilized by both MS experts within our corporation and less experienced users. Both use it very effectively. The training courses are essential for effective utilization of these libraries and databases. And this continues to add large numbers of imported spectra each year. The hybrid search greatly increases the effectiveness of all available EI and MSMS libraries. You can, all the ones that I had in the list of libraries can be converted into a hybrid library fairly routinely and used to do the hybrid search. Also during the, on the paper here on the format that I'll put on my website, I have references and that will get you to the direct part of my website that you might be interested in. So if you go to my website, you'll see today's presentation in a PDF format and you can click on these and it'll take you to the place on my website that has the information. Acknowledgements, I would really like to th thank uh, my coworkers at Eastman Chemical, Adam Howard and Kirk Clevin, and the many people that work for Steven Stein at NIST and the associated NIST contractors. So again, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.